who's counting on you. If you have kids, you have felt the weight of a life that is counting on you. If you have kids, or I mean, I, I, we had to take, I had to take care of my father as, as he got older and he passed away whenever I was, um, had just turned 20, uh, but I, I didn't have kids, but even as a teenager, I felt the weight of someone who was counting on me. But I, I know that whenever I had children and they were little babies, I was just overwhelmed by the f responsibility and the weight on my shoulders when I thought that if I don't put food in their mouth, they will starve to death. If I don't make sure they are warm when it's cold, they will freeze to death. They are completely counting on me. And in, in Texas, it generally wasn't about keeping a kid warm. It's more about keeping them cool because it's hot here a lot. And, and, uh, but if, if I didn't make sure that they were cool and the air conditioner wasn't working or there wasn't a fan blowing of some sort, there wasn't some sort of breeze, they could literally um, die. Heavy, heavy weight, and I, I'll never forget you know, that, that, that heaviness and thinking about that one day and the significance there. Last week, last week we introduced this two-part series, and we're just asking this question. Who's counting on you? Who's counting on you to connect them to Jesus? Because the truth is, every single one of us in our story of faith as we've come to know Jesus, or whether we've just started serving him or we've been serving him for many, many years, every single one of us, with every one of our faith stories, there is a relationship component attached to it where somebody said something that instigated something within us. Maybe someone invited us to a church service. Maybe someone just sat down and told us their story about what Jesus had done for them. Maybe uh, someone just lived out their faith, maybe in a tense moment, in, in a moment of, of, of pain where it was real chaotic, you watched someone and how they lived out their faith. You know, they had said they were a Christian. You kind of knew it. You not knew that about them, but you saw them live it out and it made a difference in your life. It caused you to say, I'm curious about their faith. I, I'm curious about this Jesus. That's why we believe so strongly in small groups here at North Rock. Small groups, for those that don't know, we actually call them journey groups here at North Rock. They are smaller groups of people that meet throughout the week in various places around the city. And some of them discuss the sermon the previous week. Sometimes they go through a book. Sometimes they just eat lots of food and stuff. Uh, sometimes they ride bicycles. There, there are groups that do all sorts of things. Sometimes they, uh, you know, hobby-based groups, of all sorts of groups. And we have a ton of people connected in those groups. And we believe in them because we believe in relationships. Relationships that you have in your life matter. And small groups uh, offer relationship opportunities. And, and I know that the secret, and I've learned this myself, the secret to personal freedom in my own life is transparency and honesty with somebody. And you got to have a relationship in order to do that. We've said many times that life moves at the speed of relationships. It matters who you know. It matters who you are connected to. And so relationships are very, very important. And um, somebody helped guide you and helped bring you to Jesus. So now the question is this, who's counting on you? Who's counting on you? It might have been your grandmother. It might have been your uh, mom. It might have been uh, a teacher, a coach. It could have been a friend, a coworker, but somebody help to guide you and lead you to come to know Jesus better. So now, who's counting on you to do the same for them? We'll start here today in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. <clears throat> and Acts is the fifth book of the, the New Testament. You get the first four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and those are all stories of the life of Jesus. And then you have the book of Acts, which literally is just the actions of the apostles. Some people might have thought it was like a cutting ax, but it, that's not that kind of ax. It's ax as actions. It's the actions of the followers of Jesus, what they did after he um, uh, ascended into heaven. And so we'll start here, and Jesus is actually still talking. This is just before he was um, 
he ascended into heaven and he said these words. This is after he died, after he had been buried and resurrected from the grave, just before he was caught up um, to heaven, he made, these, he made these statements. He said this, but you will receive power after when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. Everybody say witnesses. Witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that word witness is one of those words that people have a lot of crazy ideas about when they think about um, witnesses for Jesus. A lot of people think of crazy people with wide eyes and wild hair. They smell strange, and, but they're a fanatic for Jesus. And, and you, we, we think all sorts of strange things with it. Witness, be a witness for Jesus? I don't know about that. And, and a lot of people think it, you know, this is an unattainable thing. That's really not for me. It's really more for like pastors or you know, super Christians. I, I don't know if I can really be a witness for for Jesus. And so we're going to kind of talk about that word witness a little bit here for just a few moments this morning. And actually, I'm going to call this today witness protection. Witness protection because a lot of people got crazy ideas about what a witness is. So we're going to kind of protect this idea and, and try to help you understand it a little bit better. And the first thing, very simple, that, that I, I need to throw out there for everybody who's called to be a witness for Christ is we all need to, number one, accept personal responsibility. Accept the personal responsibility. Accept it. Realize that God wants me to do it, even though I actually thought the book of Acts was the kind that you cut with, you know, you cut wood with. I, I, did, I didn't know it was A-C-T-S. I didn't know that, even though I don't even, you know, know how to spell Noah until the movie came out, and I didn't even know that was a Bible story. Um, uh, even though I don't know a lot about the Bible, if you are a follower of Jesus, you don't have to know a lot about the Bible, but you need to be a witness for Christ, a witness, and accept personal responsibility. Acts chapter 20, verse number 24, uh, the apostle Paul, one of the great you know, missionaries of the Bible. In the New Testament, he started churches all over the then known world. He made this statement, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. I absolutely love this passage. The work of telling others the good news, telling others the good news, it, because it's good news. It's not bad news. It's not pointing fingers in face saying turn or burn. It's not judgmental news. Hey, if that works for somebody, great. But, but it's, it's good news. It's not bad news. Good news about the wonderful grace of God. The way that he loves you. The way that you don't have to have everything together before you come to him. The fact that he loves you even if you're struggling and wrestling with addiction. The fact that he cares for you even if you're in this building this morning and you're wrestling with pain and you feel like the worst sinner in this room. First of all, I'll tell you, you're not. Look around, look around. There's some bad people up in this room. <laughs> so feel better about yourself. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus loves you and you don't have to get everything together before you come to him. You come to him and then he helps you start to heal and helps you start to get some things straight and helps you start to change priorities and values and redefine your life. That is, that's good news. And Paul is saying, man, my life was worth nothing to me unless I use it for telling others the good news about the grace of God. But a lot of people wrestle with this idea of accepting the responsibility to be a witness for Jesus because a lot of times we think it's impossible for me to take that person, be it a friend, a coworker, neighbor, whatever, how am I going to get them in their screwed up state from being so screwed up to all the way to where they're, you know, on their way to heaven, on fire for Jesus? And that's just so far-fetched. You, you have trouble wrapping your mind around. How am I even going to do that? And so because we think we can't do it all, we choose to do nothing. 
Yesterday, we were at my, my, my youngest son was at a little basketball tournament. It was a little three-on-three tournament. It was fun. And, and as he was playing in the tournament <clears throat> a couple times, I pulled him to the side and said, Brett, take the ball to the basket and score. A lot of times we tell him, you know, take the ball, work it around, run the offense, pass the ball, make sure you have three passes before anybody takes a shot, all this kind of, you know, youth sports stuff. But when it gets serious, I'm like, dude, you take the ball to the rim and you score. (laughs) Do not pass go. Don't even look for your teammates. Don't pay attention to anybody. You dribble to the rim. Do you hear me? You hear me? Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. So, I mean, I was literally putting all the weight on his shoulders. Go score. And a lot of times when it comes to evangelism and being a witness, we feel that same kind of pressure. We think, I'm supposed to just take the ball all the way down the court and and, and I'm supposed to do it all? But listen to me. Most of the time, God is not calling you to take the ball all the way up the court and score with someone's life. Most of the time, he's just trying to get you to move move them in the right direction. Point them in the right direction. Even the great apostle Paul that I talked about, one time he made a statement where he said, I may plant the seed. Someone else comes in and waters the seed. But God is the one who brings the increase. My job is to plant or water. I don't, I don't have to do it all. And a lot of times we, we shy away from being a witness or the idea of evangelism because we Honestly, we put too much pressure on ourselves. We think I've got to do the whole thing all by myself, and that's not what God is telling you to do. I, I have this, I have this terrible quality, to be honest with you, and uh, I'm working on it. I've uh, I've been in some recovery groups, and I'm trying to grow as a person. And uh, I have some. I think it's an insecurity problem. I'm sure, but here's what it is. It's simple. If I can't do something. At a very high level, I won't do it at all. It, uh, I, okay, if, if you want me to run a race or something, if I'm not going to be in the front of the pack, I don't have to win, but if I'm not going to be in the front of the pack, you know, somewhere around the lead, like a chance to win, I'm not going to play. <laughs> I'm not going to be in the middle of the pack or, or in the back. I'm not going to do that. I want to win or have a chance to win. This is why I don't play things like soccer. Because see, in the deep south, in the deep, dirty south, Mississippi, I didn't grow up playing soccer. We played basketball, we played baseball, and we played football. So I won't run out with a bunch of guys and kick a ball around because I ain't get the first clue. I don't even know the rules. I won't talk about soccer. I'll barely, I won't hardly talk about hockey because I, I don't know the rules. I don't even understand it. And so I, I don't, I, I have this weird, and again, I'm, I'm working through it. I'm trying to overcome it. I, I know it's an insecurity thing. I got to win, got to win, got to win. Um, but, the, but a lot of people are, are, are the same way when it comes to evangelism and being a witness. We think if I, if I can't take this person all the way down the field, like if they're on the one yard line, I get them all the way into the end zone, 99 yards away, um, I'm just not going to do anything. I'll leave it to the pastors. I'll leave it to somebody else that's better at it than me. When God might be calling you to help take your coworker from the one yard line deep in their own end zone three or four yards out. Just you know, get them out of the back, get them out of their own end zone. Just get them started in the right direction. Somebody else might take them to the 20 and then somebody else to midfield and someone else take them all the way to the other end to where they can, uh, they can you know, live a healthy, uh, flourishing life with Christ. Don't put that pressure on yourself. But a lot of times, because we can't do everything, we do nothing. There's a story that I read many years ago, and many of you have probably heard this before. It was written by Jack Canfield and Mark Hansen, and they said this. A friend of ours was walking down a deserted Mexican beach at sunset. As he walked along, he began to see another man in the distance. As he drew nearer, he noticed that the local man kept leaning down, picking something up and throwing it into the water. Time and again, he kept hurling things out into the ocean. Our friend approached and he noticed that the man was picking up starfish, starfish that had been washed up on the beach, and one at a time, he was throwing them back into the water. Friend was was puzzled and he approached the man and said, good evening, friend. I was wondering what you're doing. And the guy said, I'm I'm throwing these starfish back into the ocean. You see, it's, it's low tide right now and all of these starfish have been washed up on the shore. 
If I don't throw them back into the sea, they'll die from lack of oxygen. I, I understand, my friend replied, I understand, but there must be thousands of starfish on this beach. You can't possibly get to all of them. There's simply too many. And, and don't you realize that this is probably happening on hundreds of beaches all up and down this coast? Can't you see? You can't possibly make a difference. The guy reached down and picked up another one and he threw it into the water and he said, made a difference for that one. <laughs> and he picked up another one and he tossed it into the water and said, I made a difference for that one. The truth is, we think of this idea of being a witness for Christ and seeing the world come to Christ. Sometimes it seems bigger than us. And so we just back off and cower into a corner as followers of Jesus and just say, I, I, I'm just not gonna do anything at all. Whenever God's just calling you to make a difference for that person sitting beside you at work. When God's just calling you to make a difference for your neighbor that lives across the street. And it literally may be as simple as a hello, as baking something and taking it across the street, which we used to do all the time when I was a kid, but people don't do that sort of thing anymore. So it would be so significant. Making a difference being a witness to those in your sphere of influence. That takes me to my second point, which is simply this, build influence. Number one, accept personal responsibility. Number two, build influence. Build influence. Man, everywhere that Jesus went during the three and a half years of his ministry, people were like clamoring to get to him doing everything in their power just to get close, to touch him because they had heard of him. They had seen his ministry. They had experienced his life-changing message. He had significant influence. And while we know we are not Jesus, we are the hands and the feet of Jesus, oftentimes in this world. And there's a couple of different reasons, a couple of different types of people that cause Christians to not have influence in our world. The first one is this, the Bible thumpers. You know the Bible thumpers? Maybe you, maybe you don't. These are the people who encapsulate themselves in all things Christian. They are so holy that they are of really no earthly good. Um, um, they, in, in a culture that is already skeptical of Christianity, um, they fill their schedules with Christian activities, Christian sports league, Christian camps, Christian radio. They only eat Chick-fil-A. Christian schools <laughs> have Christian clothing. They stay in their safe zones. And I love Chick-fil-A. All of these things are good things. Everything I mentioned is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with any of these things. I love Chick-fil-A, but you can't have it today because they closed on Sunday, Jack. <laughs> and if you've pulled into that drive through on Sunday, you've been bitter, just like I have. And then you say, but thank God they made a stand and they're not working on Sunday. And it is an unbelievable organization. Um, but anywho, moving on. Everybody's like hungry now. Um, the truth is when, when, when followers of Christ saturate their schedules with you know, only Christian events at only Christian venues with only Christian people, then the people that God has called us to reach have a hard time believing that we hold them in high regard and that we really want to reach them and we want them to come to know Jesus the way that we know him. We build a fence around us. The people of the world that we're trying to reach has trouble even believe. Why would we do that? And Jesus taught the complete opposite. And we talked about it last week, how he consistently hung out with bad people. And the religious people fussed that Jesus was sitting with those sinners and those tax collectors. And he's like, y'all, do you not understand? And, and, and like we said last week, he probably didn't say y'all, but he implied that. Don't you understand don't you understand that the sick are the ones who need a physician? The sick are the ones who need a doctor? It's not the people that are well, the people that are whole. So, of course, I'm going to hang out with people that desperately need me, desperately need me. So, the, the, the first problem with influence as it relates to Christians is sometimes we build walls around ourselves, which is silly. And North Rock's never been that kind of church, and we never will be. We never will be, but for those that might be wrestling with that, I want you to know that's 
that's not the way to build influence. Number two, the second struggle is the polar opposite, and that is when people who claim to be a follower of Jesus have no influence because their peers don't see anything different about you than they do about people that are proud heathens. There should be a difference in the way a follower of Christ lives and the way someone who, I don't really care much about Jesus, I'm a hell raiser. There should be a difference in the way these two people live. We did a series a few years ago at North Rock called Practical Atheism. And we defined that as someone who claims to be a follower of Christ. Yes, I follow Jesus. And yet, their life does not paint that same picture. You, hang, you follow them around for a day and you go, what? You said you follow Jesus? Is that what you said? And granted, it ain't about being perfect because we're not expected to be perfect. I mean, everybody gets ticked off in traffic from time to time and it, it's, oh, it's okay not to be okay, but there should be a distinct difference in someone who claims to be a follower of Jesus and someone who does not. You ever met someone who was not what they claim to be? Yeah, yep, yep, yep. I we, we years ago <clears throat> at a church, we had someone we needed a guitar player, and they said, "I'm a guitar player." <laughs> oh, you are awesome! Come to rehearsal, and this guitar player came to rehearsal, and they got their guitar out. And I'm wondering what was, now, looking back, I'm thinking, what was going through his mind at this point? Because we came to find out he's not a guitar player, and yet he said he was a guitar player. And so, so we sat down, and, you know, I, don't, I play guitar a little bit. I, I, I don't really play anymore, but, I mean, I got, a, I got North Rock through a couple of years until we got some real musicians, thank God for our band. Um, <laughs> But, but, I mean, I know, I know where to put my fingers to play certain chords, you know. I know where G is, I know where D is, I know where E is, I know where A is, I know where C is. Just kind of the basic guitar chords. And it came time for him to play a D, and I said, that's, that's a D right there, it's a D. And, and I see him over there going, I was like. <laughs> and I eased over there and I got his finger and I said, but that one there, this one here, you know, like I would my child. Um. And I put it on, and, and I realized pretty quickly, he's not a guitar player. <laughs> he claimed to be one, but he was not. And my fear is, as followers of Christ, a lot of people say, you, you claim to be a follower, and yet I, I don't really see anything different about you than people who don't claim to be followers of Christ. You tend to blend into society. Uh, you don't really appear to even want to be salt and light. There's really not much of a distinction. It's a story that's told, um, again, in the book of Acts, um, about two men, Paul and Silas. I've already mentioned Paul. He wrote, by the way, 14 books in the New Testament of, of, of the Bible. And he traveled all over the world. Had a great, unique salvation moment with with, with God, where he was struck down, blinded, and just this great story, an undeniable experience that Paul had. And it fired him up. And his life completely turned around. And so he's fired up, traveling around, preaching the gospel, going to different towns and starting churches, telling them about Jesus. And he had a preaching partner whose name was Silas. Silas traveled with him and helped him preach. And, and uh, man, they, they took a lot of flack. It took a lot of, uh, they, were, they were arrested over and over again because, just because they were preaching about Jesus. I mean, it was, it was bad news. They would go, they'd have to sneak around a little bit and sometimes they'd be a little bit too bold and they'd get arrested and thrown into you know, prison for a while. Paul was arrested again and again. And the truth is, how many of you know that, that someone's real character is revealed during bad times? How many of you know that? You've experienced that? When, when stress is, is, is at, the, at the surface, um, and the pastor I used to work for used to say all the time, you, you really don't get to know a man until you play around a round of golf with him. <laughs> and those of you that play golf, you, you, you probably can, can concur. Uh, and until he shanks one into the water and you look at him, see how he's going to react. How are you going to react to that, Bubba? Or he hits one out in the trees and he goes to hit it out of the trees and it hits another tree and bounces right back at him. 
that's when you really get to know somebody and who, you know, who they really are. There's a lot of truth in that because a person's character is, is really revealed during stress and during some dark times and, and bad days. So Paul and Silas had had a really bad day. They had been preaching about Jesus and they were arrested. They were stripped in public. They were beaten. They were flogged on this particular day. They'd been placed in a dungeon. They had their legs put in stocks. Stocks is where they, you know, they spread your legs and, and lock them down, and it, it induced cramping. It was just ultimate torture. In the dungeon, legs in stocks, and here's where we pick up the story in Acts chapter 16, verse number 23, and it says this, about midnight... About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. So get a picture in your mind of two little fellas who had been stripped, beaten, thrown into the dungeon, legs in stocks, bad day, y'all, bad day. And here they are singing and praying to God. The very one that because they were preaching about him to start with, They were arrested and all these bad things happened. And here's what I want you to see. And the other prisoners were listening to them. People always watching you. People always watching how you're going to react under stress. Somebody's always looking. And granted, nobody expects you to be perfect. We do expect you to be different. If you want to build influence, if you want to cause people to go, there's something different about that person. Something unique, something special. I wonder what it is. People were watching them. Prisoners were listening to them. Acts 16, 26, the story continues. And suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. It was a miraculous jailbreak. You know, God said, you've been preaching about me. Yeah, I let you go through all this hell, but now I'm going to get you on out of there so you can go preach some more. And it was a miraculous jailbreak, earthquake, foundations of prison were shaken. And at once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. That's significant. Everybody's chains came loose. Not just Paul and Silas, but because they were living out their faith in a very tangible way by staying faithful even in their pain, Everybody's chains wound up being loose. The story continues that the jailer woke up, the jailer that was in charge of kind of watching over, and he realized that everybody had been loose, and I'm sure it was somewhat chaos. People running around all over the place, and he's thinking, oh my God, I'm going to be held accountable. And it must have been bad in those days because he decided to take his own life because of this jailbreak. And he figured he was going to be blamed somehow by the, by the authorities. And so he was about to take his own life. And Paul said, no, 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 no. Stop, stop, stop. Don't hurt yourself. We're here. We're, we're still here. And the jailer called for lights and he came in trembling. And, and this is what he said. This is what he, this is what he did. Verse 30. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? significant influence. Trust me, I'm sure they were on his nerves singing and praising God at midnight. If you're the jailer and you're just kind of wanting everybody to calm it on down. I mean, it, it's midnight, you're on the midnight shift, you're just wanting to surf, safe, for, for, surf Facebook is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> And you just want to check your Twitter feed. You're not really wanting to deal with the racket coming from those crazy prisoners. But he heard them singing. He knew what they were doing. This earthquake happened. They stayed around. He was influenced, impacted heavily by Paul and Silas, by their faithfulness. And he said, I got to have what you have. Of course, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Believe in Jesus and you will be saved. It's so simple. We make it so difficult. We think evangelism is this huge, heavy, dark cloud. Witness, I can't be a witness. It's so simple. Live out your faith. And most of the time when you're living out your faith, I'm not saying you gotta be like singing in the office and doing crazy, but but when you live out your faith, 
and people know there's something different about you, they're going to automatically be attracted to you. And he just answered the question, believe in the Lord Jesus. Verse 33, the story continues. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them up and washed their wounds. Wow, what a transfer. He goes from tormenting to, to helping uh, wash their wounds. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. We got baptisms today. It's one of my most exciting things that we do around North Rock. And if you haven't been baptized, you're welcome to be baptized today, even if you're not signed up. Baptism is just a, a, a public statement of, of faith, going public with what the decision that you've made already internally to follow Jesus. We got clothes for you, we got towels for you, we can take care of you. We got a lot of people signed up already, but if you're not signed up, you can be baptized today. But his family were baptized, the jailer brought him into his house, set a meal before them, and he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. Lives are changed around us when we have influence, when we have influence. And the third thing, accept Accept personal accountability. Accept that, that I am responsible to help bring people to Jesus. Uh, build influence. And thirdly, share your personal story. Share your personal story. Jesus said you will be witnesses. What's a witness? A witness comes onto a witness stand, is called to a stand, takes an oath, and hopefully tells the truth about his side of the story. He tells what he saw, what he experienced. That's all a witness is. I'm just going to tell you what I know happened or what I saw or what I experienced. That's, that's all being a witness for Jesus is. You don't have to be able to spell Melchizedek or you don't, you don't have to be able to, to, to recite you know, the books of the Bible in order. You don't have to know Psalm 23 word for word. You don't have, to, even if you thought Acts was you know, the, the cutting kind instead of A-C-T-S, it doesn't matter. You, you don't have to have everything together. All you need to have is a story of how Jesus Christ has changed your world. And if you do, then you are a witness. You are a witness. Being a witness for Jesus is nothing more than telling your side of the story to someone. Man, people can argue with theology. They can debate about what that scripture means or what that scripture means. They can argue all kinds of stuff. But I'm going to tell you what people cannot argue with. They cannot argue with your story. They can't argue with your story. They might try, but they can't. It's my story. And if, you've, if you live out your faith and you have influence and you tell someone your story, it's going to make an impact. Even if you don't see it, even if it's just planting, planting the seed, you know, it's down under the dirt and you may not see anything come of it, it will make a difference. Share your personal story. And fourth, fourth, and this is big, give an invitation Give an invitation, a personal invitation. An invitation could be a lot of things. It, it could be inviting someone to coffee to talk about your story and to let, let them talk about theirs. It could be inviting someone to lunch. It could be inviting one, someone into your, into your journey group. It could be inviting uh, someone just to open up and tell their story, you know, around the water cooler. It could be inviting someone to come to church. It could be inviting someone to come on Easter Sunday morning. Man, this is the time of the year where people come to church. People who don't go to church come to church on Easter. You know, the people that just go on the big days. Well, this is one of those big days coming up. We affectionately call them CEOs, Christmas, Easter onlys. <laughs> And we love that. It's all right. It's fine. We're happy to have CEOs in the building on Easter Sunday morning because if you've heard me say it, if they can get into the presence of God, he can make an eternal difference in their life. In just a moment, church is a chance. Getting them into this building gives God a chance to work in their lives in an environment, an atmosphere that is prepared because we're going to be praying all week. The church has been praying for, we've run a 40-day prayer challenge right now leading up to Easter. It's going to be an amazing, amazing day. You need to get somebody into this building with you. I have something I want to share with you real quickly on the screen. 